So welcome everybody to our talk, The Aggregate is Dead, Long Live the Aggregate. My name is Sara Pellegrini. And my name is Milan Savic. So in our life we are software engineer, but today we are here in a completely different guise and a well-defined target. We are here to kill the aggregate. So for, for those who are not familiar with domain-driven design and uh, the aggregate pattern, let me introduce that for you. So the aggregate uh, has always been for me one of the most weakest and confusing concepts of domain-driven design. And its definition is quite vague. So an aggregate is a cluster of associated objects that we treat as a unit for the purpose of data changes. So even if I cannot see you completely, I would like to uh, ask uh, you a question. Who is uh, experienced with domain-driven design and knows exactly what this definition means? Can you raise your hand? Thank you. OK. Few. Uh, and uh, who have seen this definition for the very first time here today? OK. So I'm curious about. Uh, the others. So, how many of you believe that this definition is a little bit cloudy? Okay. And um, I can <coughs> confirm that uh, uh, during uh, my consultancy activity, I've noticed that the full understanding of uh, the aggregate pattern of uh, the concept of the aggregate is difficult for uh, many. And uh, it is easy to make mistakes, and these mistakes are difficult to be fixed later. And as a result, a certain percentage of developers believe that the work architecture is overcomplicated. So let's try to clarify a little bit. Yes, uh, to help us here, we are going to consult uh, Blue Book, and it, it will try to basically bridge the gap from uh, theory to practice. So let's see what it says. It says that we should cluster the entities and value objects into aggregates and define boundaries around each. We should choose one entity to be the root of each aggregate and control all access to the objects inside the boundary through the root. And we should allow external objects to hold reference to the root only. But what does it mean in practice? Uh, how are we going to build our intuition when it comes to designing our systems? It is, I would say, still still vague and now for today as you may notice the theme of the presentation is uh, kill bill movie also by sarah's outfit uh, we chose five villains from the movie and each one of them is going to represent a pitfall of an aggregate and we are going to try to address those so those of you who had uh, seen the movie you're going to have a great time others i, I hope good enough so in order to understand better the complexity of the aggregate and the criticalities of the aggregate, we want to do an exercise together, an even storming exercise. The domain is the education domain, the educational domain. And uh, the rules are pretty simple. A course cannot accept more than N students. And N, that is the course capacity, can change any time to any positive integer that is different from the current one. Even if, remember this part, the number of currently subscribed students is larger than a new value. And in this case, what happens is very simple. The course will not be able to accept any further subscription until a sufficient number of unsubscription has taken place to allow the new subscription. So basically to uh, have the student subscribed lower than the capacity again. So, Let's uh, start modeling this exercise to the board. So we know that a course can be created. We know that a student can subscribe to a course or can unsubscribe to a from a course. And we know that the course capacity can change from time to time. So let's now move, identify what triggers these uh, events. So which commands are triggered these events. In our uh, exercise, we can simply say that all these events are triggered by requests from the user, from their respective commands. So, so far, so good. It's pretty simple, right? Linear, 
not a lot of difficulties. And why is that? Thanks to the storytelling. So one of the most incredible achievements of domain-driven design is that it uh, broke, uh, is that is, um, have tried to break down the barriers between technicians and domain experts, thanks to tools that are capable of exploiting the immense potential of the storytelling, exactly like even storming does. So storytelling is so powerful because it is innate in human nature. You don't need any special skill or competence to tell a story, right? And it really helps to break down the barriers between technicians and domain experts. But in my experience, the uh, discovery process that is really amazing, at the very, that, that is really fluent at the beginning, it has next, it, it hits a snag when we try to introduce the aggregate into the story. Why? Because the aggregate is uh, primarily was invented to respond to a technical requirement. The, the aggregate is the boundary of consistency, is, a, is a, a way uh, to guarantee uh, the strong consistency in a world by nature eventually consistent. So, at the same time, the aggregate tried to represent a concept, a business concept, that uh, acts as a guardian for a set of business rules. It's very, very difficult to explain what the aggregate is to a business expert. So when a change to any object with the aggregate boundary is committed, all invariants of the whole aggregate must be satisfied. This is clearly a technical, um, a technical description, a technical explanation. So when I, as a technician, try to identify aggregates in my system, the first thing I do is to cluster data that share the same consistency constraints. In this example, the rules were all about the curse. And that's why I would choose exactly the curse as an aggregate for this exercise. But uh, translating this in non-technical terms to explain what an aggregate is to business people is far from easy. We can use some metaphor or some uh, asking some question, for example, who would you send this command to? Or uh, in which box would you put this information? Or who, is, uh, who guarantees you that this rule is not violated? So these are tricks, sometimes are helpful, but not always really effective. So here we are in front of the first villain in our story. The aggregate does not fit storytelling. So the introduction of the aggregate into the story breaks the fluidity of the discovery process. It is an element that does not fit the storytelling. It's us as technicians that we forcefully try to introduce it to fulfill our needs. And uh, the aggregate was created exactly to um, respond to a technical needs. And we know that uh, business ex experts should not worry about any technical aspect of our system. Nevertheless, in a way, they are asked to identify exactly these elements that are technical by definition. And furthermore, the aggregate brings our attention back to the data structure and away from the behavior. So, now in front of us, we have a second villain in our story, and it says that aggregates uh, mix technical and business aspects. Usually in our minds, in our heads, we have our vision of the domain. However, we should also take care of the business invariants. Now, when we try to group those two together into a single model, we hit the difficulties, right? There are some... Uh, business rules that can span over several domain concepts. And this is where we, where we uh, struggle. What some people try to do is try to group data that change together and then try to, to observe the system like that. However, not all people are capable of doing so. Maybe it is too early in the business process, etc., etc. But what people try to do is to take a look at our uh, result of event storming, for example, and then we are searching for uh, 
uh, nouns. We are searching for entities, names, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in our case, that is going to be the course. So this is our aggregate. This is the result of our finding. We grouped these together into an aggregate. What does it basically mean? It means that this guy is going to be uh, capable of handling uh, commands for creating the course, subscribing, unsubscribing, and updating the course capacity. And it is also responsible for publishing corresponding events. Now let's move uh, to the, how to say, to the on disk. So what happens uh, with the uh, persistence? This is a situation where we want to store our aggregate as, as state stored. That means that we store only the current state of the aggregate into our uh, storage. Here we have a course and bunch of subscriptions. When this course needs to handle subscribe and unsubscribe student from the course commands, it is going to load uh, the whole state from the database. And for this specific use case, it is necessary to load everything, right? But what happens when you want to uh, handle the update course capacity? Again, because our um, aggregate is unit of consistency, we need to load everything. But for updating the course capacity, we don't need subscriptions, right? We can just uh, deal with the course details. So this is in the state uh, storage world. If you move to the event sourced, world. What does it mean? It basically means that we are going to store uh, a state of our aggregate as series of events that were published by that aggregate. Here we have some events that have happened. When we, are, uh, when we want to handle subscription and unsubscription, we are going to load all events. In this case, again, necessary. But when we want to handle update course capacity command, we only need these two events that course uh, has been created and that capacity has been changed. We do not need anything else. However, we are going to load it because this is our uh, consistency uh, boundary. Okay, let's now increase a little bit uh, the complexity of the exercise with a new rule. The course title can change any time to any title different from the current one. So let's go back to the board. We need a new event, the course has been renamed. And of course, we need a new command that triggered this event. So can anybody guess who is the aggregate this event and the uh, command belongs? Anybody? Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, that is a, a very mm, reasonable answer. And uh, the curse is now a little bit larger. It's boundary are a little bit larger than before, and it may seem irrelevant, but be careful because it hides a pitfall. So let me introduce the third villain in our story. The larger the aggregate, the greater the contention. So our natural attitude to identify the aggregates into the business concept that uh, we have in mind in our mental model can lead us to uh, enlarge uh, the boundary of the aggregate in a, an unnecessary way. So anytime we have a new event, a new command that uh, relates to a mental concept that is represented by an aggregate, we tend to assign these commanded events to that aggregate. And it is fine, but we also need to remember that the boundary of consistency is also the boundary of concurrency. And for this very reason, it's very, very important to um, the, the correct sizing of the aggregate, as the correct sizing can affect a lot the performance of our application. So we could absurdly decide to model our system with a unique single aggregate. And in this case, this decision will prevent any concurrent access because all operation should be handled by a single aggregate that acts as a contention point. And of course, our performance would be really bad. This is not what we want. So let's try to make an example to see how concurrency works in these systems. So let's say that we receive at the very same time two commands related to the same course instance. One command is the one to request the curse capacity to be changed, and the other one to request that 
the curse as, uh, will be renamed. So both commands are handled at the same time. In other words, two instances of the same aggregate are loaded from the database, and they are modified accordingly to their respective commands. So the problem arises when we try to persist the transaction, because as we know that the aggregate is the guardian of invariance, it, it is not possible to accept two concurrent modification. And while the first one, the first transaction, will be accepted, okay, the second one will be necessarily rejected. It doesn't matter that the two operations uh, do not influence each other. It doesn't matter that inside the, ag the aggregate itself, the, there are mm, two information that are not uh, really dependent, right? So the changing the curse name and changing its capacity will not uh, interfere in any way. The only fact that they belong to the same aggregate uh, is... Uh, um, it's able to prevent any concurrent execution of them. So assigning both of these commands to the same aggregate as um, the result of increasing the contention in a way that would not be necessary, because we know that these operations are not aff affecting each other. Nevertheless, they need to be executed sequentially. OK, let's try to mitigate what Sarah was complaining about. She was complaining about that a lot. So let's try to propose alternative solution. Of course, we can fix this. So instead of having a single aggregate uh, that's going to handle both course and subscriptions, we are going to introduce two aggregates. Right? One is going to handle course subscriptions, and the other one is, is responsible for handling course info, course details. However, this is not so. Uh, not so good solution as well. So let's try to see pros and cons on bo of both solutions. So we had a single aggregate course, and now we have course info and course subscriptions. A course had more contention, as Sarah explained, but it was simpler, right? It was a single unit to manage, single thing to, to care about. When it comes to course info and course subscriptions, we have less contention, that's obvious, right? Because now we can direct our commands to the correct aggregate. It is going to load only necessary data. We are not going to have conflicts on those. But the problem with this approach is additional complexity. We need to manage more stuff. When we want to create a new course, we need to create a new course info and course subscriptions. What happens if one of those two fails? Also, when it comes to deletion of the course, right? We need to coordinate between, between them. So we had um, an application designed. It was running in production. Uh, we were storing the state of our aggregates, and then we noticed the contention. Now let's try to change our model. Let's try to go from a single aggregate approach to multiple aggregate approach. What are we going to do? We have something stored. If we are storing only the current state, we are probably in SQL. Uh, database world, we can just run the script and update what's necessary. Uh, sometimes this is even more complicated because we may choose, due to some uh, technical reasons, to serialize the state of our aggregate. And in that case, we need a database that is capable of deserializing, adapting, serializing the state, and storing it back again. Uh, possible, but in some databases, it's not so trivial to be done. But what happens in the event source aggregates, right? This is something that is uh, unknown, uh, not so trivial. Why is that? Because we know that events are immutable, so they are not to be changed, not to be updated. And we know that our event stream should stay uh, let's say, immutable as well. We shouldn't insert events in the stream, we shouldn't delete events, etc., etc. But let's try to exemplify this. Here we have... Uh, some events stored in our event store. And now this is a single aggregate approach. Green means that it belongs to the course aggregate. We now want to refactor this into two aggregates. First of all, whenever course is created, we need to create subscriptions and a course info. And then later on, we need to go and find the owner for a specific event and reassign. So course renamed is going to belong to the course info, while course capacity uh, events are going to belong to the uh, course subscriptions um, aggregate. 
In this case, we see that we need a really good event store that can support this, that can support changing of the ownership and inserting events. Maybe in some cases we also need to delete events. And this is not so trivial thing to do. This is our fourth villain. Uh, aggregates are hard to refactor. We say here hard because it is possible, but definitely not uh, an easy thing to do. So, a little more spice in our exercise with, again, a new rule. The student cannot join more than N courses. So, back to the board. We, of course, know that a student can be created and that we need the relative command. But now things get complicated because uh, now I know I, I, um, I need a new event for uh, subscribe a student to a course and a new event to unsubscribe a student from a course with their respective commands. Do you have a deja vu? I hope you have because we uh, have uh, met to very similar events and commands when we were talking about the, com the course aggregate. But now I need two more because uh, uh, we the rule, the new rule that we have uh, that we need to verify is about a new aggregate, the student aggregate. So why do I need to separate events to describe the same fact in real life? Because the life is hard and uh, I need technically to verify the invariance in two different aggregates. So there is a technical explanation for that. So let's say that we are happy with that and that we have uh, uh, our new student aggregate. This student aggregate is able to handle some commands and to publish some events. So exactly as the course aggregate, um, the student will contain the subscription that are needed to validate the following subscription and a subscri unsubscription request. So this situation requires a certain form of synchronization. Indeed, any time uh, there is a request to a subscribe a student to a course, this request must be handled by a component that is able to dispatch, to forward the respective commands to both, ag uh, to both course and student aggregates. The student and the course will be able then to publish their respective events. Simple enough, unless one of these two aggregates refuse uh, the command. For example, when uh, uh, the curse is fully booked, it could happen that curse refused the command. And uh, in this case, the orchestrating component must react accordingly se by sending uh, another command to the student aggregate to cancel the previous uh, subscription. So this is one of the solutions. There are other solutions of this problem. But anyway, you may feel that we need to introduce complexity to handle this uh, problem, right? So here you are, the fifth and final villain in our story. Transactions that span multiple aggregates could cause unnecessary complexity. So the main aspect underlying the aggregate concept is the idea of boundary. The aggregate is the boundary of consistency, is the boundary of concurrency, but I would say most of all is the boundary of complexity. It was uh, created exactly to force the developer to, to feel this friction, right? To, to uh, need to define this small bubble that are isolated from each other, where the context inside is so minimal to make all the decision inside very simple, trivial. And uh, this is very good, right? Because this uh, is completely in line with uh, the good practices, uh, good programming practices, like the coupling and high cohesion. And uh, it is great, but as a side effect, it can lead to an uh, increase of the complexity whenever the consistency constraints span multiple aggregate. Someone could uh, answer, that is just a long transaction. What is wrong with wrong, long transaction? and nothing is, is wrong with them. They are perfectly normal and very common when uh, uh, we cross the, the boundary of the uh, bounded context. 
But my question is, uh, whenever the uh, long transaction happens within the same software component, within the same bounded context, it is really necessary to introduce this complexity, or there is an alternative solution we can adopt. So we will see that. So here they are, all the negative aspects of uh, the aggregates. The aggregate does not fit the storytelling. It puts focus back on the data structure instead of the behavior. It mixes technical and business aspects. It can cause unnecessary contention and unnecessary complexity. And it is hard to refactor. So we just need to shoot it down. Yes, and we've been bothered by these pitfalls for quite some time. And then we were thinking whether there is a better way to implement our command model. And unfortunately, we couldn't find a solution. So we just came here to complain. <laughs> no. Uh, so what are we going to try here? We're going to try to focus on behavior more than on the structure of our, of our model. Let's try now to observe our system. Uh, let's restart from the storytelling, and let's see how, what we can observe. What we have in our system is basically a series of actions and reactions to those actions. What ties those two together are decision blocks. So they, based on certain action, we have a decision block that is going to decide to, to, to react to this specific action. As one of the decision block, we can have a person, lady in this case, and she is based on her experience, her prior knowledge. She can also take a look at the system and retrieve some information. So based on those, she's going to make the action. She's going to say, I want to change this within the system. On the other hand, we can also have a software component acting in the same role, uh, being a decision block. Similarly to the lady, um, software component can look in the system, can retrieve necessary data in order to create any uh, necessary model and to react to this uh, specific request, basically publishing an event or whatever. We are going to focus on this decision. In our world, this uh, decision block is basically a message handler. So message handler exists only to make the decision. That's it. And the message handler knows what data uh, it needs to load and where to load it from. In order to help us even further on this journey, we are going to use event sourcing. And why is that? Because event sourcing provides an advantage because it decouples the persistence from the model needed for taking the decision. And now when our message handler takes this advantage, it can on the fly, basically dynamically load what it needs, make the correct model, make the decision, and publish an event uh, if necessary. Let's try to take uh, a look at the example. Here we have our event store. We want to handle update course capacity command. There are certain events present. Uh, these all events are related to the course. So basically, we, need, we needed to load them previously with the aggregate, right? Because we needed um, uh, our unit of consistency. But our command handler says, OK, we, I just need to check whether the course exists and whether the capacity is different from the previous one. So what it is going to do, it is going to say, OK, I don't need this course renamed. I'm not interested in that. So I'm going to load only the data that, I'm, that I need. And based on that, I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to publish course capacity changed or not, depending uh, on whether the, the data meets the criteria. When it comes to the event store, we must uh, take a look at the event store with the different glasses, with different view. Uh, so instead of streaming events per specific aggregate identifier, we are going to stream events based on certain query that we here call stream query. Uh, this stream query is comprised of uh, two things. The first thing uh, are domain identifiers. So what are we interested in our domain? In our situation, that is the course with its corresponding identifier. And then we have 
types of uh, events that can help us to narrow down the, the information that we need to retrieve from the system. And in this case, we are interested only in course created and course capacity changed events. Two of them together form a stream query. Again, the focus is on the message handler, which comes with several benefits. The very first one is that we have less waste of resources. Just by loading only necessary information, we are going to save on the CPU usage, on the memory usage, network bandwidth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it will also come with a relaxed um, mode of developing systems because we don't need to make decisions really early. So we can be a little bit lean about them. We can decide as late as possible. So we don't need to model anything upfront. And we have more flexibility because now we can change uh, our models more dynamically. We don't have any boundaries that we have to fit our, our new business rules into. So let's go back to my favorite topic, that is concurrency. And let's see what happens when we receive at the very same time two commands. One is the command for rename the course, and the, one, the other one is to command to update course capacity. So our instinct immediately tells us there will be no conflicts, right? So the two decision blocks can uh, load the respective data and uh, we know that the business rules are not conflicting. So they can together uh, stream the event store, reconstruct the respective model, and then publish the respective events without any problem. But what happens if the two events are the one for subscribe the student to a course and to update the course capacity? Of course, the same instance. This case is different, right? Because there is a risk of collision here. So let's say that uh, these two decision blocks load together their uh, event stream, the one that are necessary to build their respective model to make their decision. And let's suppose that the first block that is capable of emitting an event is the one about the update of the curse capacity. And just a few milliseconds later, the uh, other block is uh, publishing the, the subscription event. However, in this case, it could happen that the, the capacity changed, happened just a few milliseconds before, could invalidate the decision made about the subscription, because the capacity could be reduced to the point to prevent this, that subscription to happen. So, the first block was not aware of the curse capacity change, the last one, when it built its model to make the decision. How we can handle this uh, situation? So I'm always a little bit excited here because I believe this is a very uh, revolutionary idea. And this is the idea that could allow us to replace the aggregate with something more flexible. So, Together with the regular append API that uh, an event store should provide, an event store should also provide another API that we can call conditional append. So the conditional append requires two additional parameters besides the events to be appended. That are the stream query and the last event identifier. The stream query is the query that uh, was uh, used to build the model needed to make a decision. And the last event is the last event that was included during the reconstruction of the model. Okay? So what are these two parameters needed for? These two parameters are, need parameter are needed to verify that uh, at the time of the append, there are no new information that could uh, uh, influence my decision that I'm not aware of. So basically, I needed to verify that at the time of the pen, there is no new event matching the query after the last expected one. So let's make a clear example. If at the time of the pen, the last event returned by the query is different 
from the last event that is passed as a parameter of the conditional append, it means that my decision is potentially wrong because it was made on the basis of out-of-date data. So it, it means that probably I have published a subscription when I couldn't because uh, I was not aware of the change of the uh, capacity. It happens just a few milliseconds before. So in this case, the append is rejected because the condition is not satisfied, right? The decision block can then decide to retry and to load again the model that this time will, will be necessary, most up to date, uh, and to um, publish again the uh, event if it is still valid situation. So basically the conditional append is the warranty of our consistency. The events are appended if and only if there are no other events matching the query after the expected one, the, the latest expected one, right? Basically, uh, represent the guarantee that my decision is made on the most up-to-date data. And it is a form of optimistic lock specific for even sourcing system. So let's go back to the example. So it's the same example. Uh, we did before. The first block, so both blocks are, um, have loaded their, let me come back one second. Both decision block load their respective stream and the last event they both load is the number 592. Then let's say that the first block that is able to invoke the conditional append is the one about the update of the curse capacity. So, at this point, the event store verify if there is an event after the 992 that matches the query. And since there is none, it, the append is accepted. When the second decision block invoke the conditional append, um, at this point, the event store try to verify if there is an event matching the query after the 592. And since there is one, in this case, the append will be rejected, since it is potentially wrong. So, uh, the benefit that we have with this approach is that now our contention is going to be limited. It comes somewhat naturally, but let's rehearse it again. Uh, before we had the boundaries of contention, one of the aggregate, but now those are of the stream query. And by having loading less data, we have less, less contention. But we can go even further. We can improve this even further. When you go back to our drawing board, when we, doing, when, we, when we were doing event storming, we see this artificial scenario, right? We have those duplicates. That feels awkward, right? Why do we need those? If you go to our event store, here they are, right? They were happening and they were the only difference that, uh, that they have is that the ownership is different. When a business a a expert comes and asks, why do you need those two events, their duplicates? We cannot explain them in a way that they, they can understand. We can explain them in technical terms. We needed them because we needed to guard the uh, invariance of our two aggregates, but essentially we, we don't need them. So let's try to go to the storytelling. Only one thing happened. There was uh, either command to subs subscribe or to unsubscribe, decision was made, and we had an event published. So only one thing, only a single thing happened. Let's try to, to fix this mess. Firstly, we are going to remove the ownership. We are going to have only pure events. So they care only about the facts, what happened. But again, we still need the connection with the domain, right? So we are going to tag those events with specific tags, uh, domain identifiers, we call them here as well. We don't need the ownership, right? Again, we here have the duplicates. And now the duplication is even more absurd because now everything is the same. The only thing that's different is that we have two domain identifiers uh, relating to those two events. So what we can do is just merge them into one event and have two pointers to the same event. With this approach, we lost the duplicates. So this grants us another exceptional advantage. 
let's discover which one through an example again. Let's see how our system now behaves when we need to handle the subscribe student course command. So, we know that uh, the decision block is completely aware of uh, the business rule that we need to validate before publishing the subscribe student to course event. And now, this decision block can take advantage from the flexibility of a query. And it can load at the very same time in the same stream um, both information, both events about the course and the student. So the command handler is able to stream the events that are interesting for, for uh, validating the business rule and to validate in the very uh, same uh, time, the very same moment, if the course uh, does not have more than n students, and if the students uh, has the correct number of uh, uh, has joined the correct number of uh, curses at the very same moment, and if both rules are not violated, it can publish a single event subscribe a student subscribe to curse that is bound to two business concepts: the student and the aggregate, uh, so the student and the curse. So, therefore, the event store should not be able only to uh, append events, but domain events, where a domain event is nothing more than a pair formed by the pure event and the collection of domain identifiers that are bound to it. So, in uh, uh, this example, uh, the domain identifier is formed by a key value pair where the key is uh, the concept, right? The curse concept or the student concept, and the value is the instance, the unique instance. Uh, but this is just an example. Everything that uh, is unique inside the bounded context is a valid, um, is a valid domain identifier. So each event has its own domain identifier. Two events that are um, appended in the same transaction could have different domain ident identifier. Let's make an example. If uh, when a student subscribes to a curse, I reach the capacity of the curse, I may want to publish a specific event uh, to describe that the curse is fully booked. And of course, they are both published in the same transaction. The first one will be bound to curse and student, while the second one will be bound only to curse. So let's translate this in pseudocode. Uh, we have our conditional append API. In this case, there are two events that we want to uh, append. The first one, student subscribe to curse, that has uh, uh, two domain identifiers. And the second one is curse fully booked, this time bounded to only one domain identifier. The stream query is the one that was uh, used when uh, the decision block loaded the model needed to make this decision. And the last event identifier is the identifier included, the last identifier included in the, um, during the reconstruction of the model. So if anything happened after the last identifier that could affect my decision, this append would be rejected. Let's now try to see, uh, to zoom into these pure events, basically, they, they, they represent the, the, the facts that are more closer to, to reality. But let's see their characteristics. So they do not belong to an aggregate. Uh, they're just description that something important, basically a fact that something important has happened in the, in the business. And it, one event can be related to one or multiple domain concepts. There are some benefits. Uh, of, of these pure events. The first one is less complexity, no ownership. Uh, our decision now can involve course and student in our example, really easy. Our decision block can load everything. There, there are no restrictions to that. And decision is taken in one place, so we can really zoom into this one and make our judgment better. 
when we were talking about this orchestrator or business process that was uh, here in charge of coordinating commands to, to corresponding aggregates, this is no longer needed. However, we need this in case when we want to coordinate our actions across several bounded contexts. This is something that we do not want to mix into single uh, command handler. Another benefit that we have is more flexibility. Again, this flexibility comes from the event sourcing because event sourcing decouples persistence from the model needed for taking the action. What will, gives, what will this give us is basically easier refactoring. Now, when we want to refactor, we are just going to change the streaming query, the stream query, what we need to load, uh, which event types, and from which domain identifiers. And then our job is much, much easier. So the aggregate is finally dead, together with all the negative aspects associated with it. This new approach that we decided to call dynamic consistency boundary, or DCB if you want, it's a perfect match with the storytelling. It focuses on behavior instead of model. It reduces the complexity and the contention, and it is simpler to refactor. So, the aggregate is that, be careful, does not mean that uh, you should uh, uh, model your system with a thousand of completely unrelated command handler, absolutely not. So clustering commands into logical group and delegating their execution to the same model is a remain a uh, completely valid uh, programming approach. The difference lies in the fact that um, by the very definition of the aggregate, this model necessarily must be isolated from each other. So killing the aggregate means admitting the possibility of contamination between this boundary, right? Between this model, uh, and without renouncing consistency anyway. So it's a less dogmatic approach, which in any case must not disregard good, good programming practices. But that thanks to uh, a greater flexibility, it allows the best design to emerge over time. So the ability to create this intersection um, is not needed to be exploited in all situations. There will be hundreds of cases where this is not needed. So of course, as always, there is no a single truth. There is no a single tool right for everything. Everything must use with pragmatism and common sense. That's all for today. Thank you. If you have uh, any question, so we are here for uh, two minutes and a half, or otherwise you can find us at the Exonic booth in the hall. But if you have any question now, we are also here. Yeah. But it's also lunch, so I can understand that. Yeah. <laughs>